Our next speaker is uh, Forrest Rauer. Forrest is um, currently a professor at San Diego State uh, in San Diego. He, his areas of, of work have, have been, um, again, eclectic, but focused upon uh, the virome. We'll return to some themes that Skip brought up. Um, and also uh, coral uh, biology and coral ecology, and, um, and then the, the interface between those two, as well as um, the human system that he's now become quite interested in. So um, Forrest has done some really interesting work. Speaking of interesting RNA viruses, one day you'll have to tell this audience about um, uh, hot pepper viruses and, and humans. Uh, in any case, Forrest, welcome, and thanks for being here. All right, uh, thanks for having me. And uh, today I'm gonna, so I kind of got this nebulous title and the, what I'm gonna tell you about is really starts with my coral work. Um, and for those of you that aren't aware of it, corals are actually basically the, uh, some of the oldest animals left on the planet. So they've been around 550 million years easily, probably longer than that. They build the biggest structures on the planet which are the coral reefs, and they um, actually also have a ton of herpes viruses. So the herpes viruses have been around for at least that long. I'm going to talk to you uh, a little bit about them, as well as some of the, our human work. And basically, the thing that unites these systems is going to be the mucosal membrane, which is the thing that uh, unites a lot of my work, thinking about what's going on on the snot layers, and, um, and of course, the viruses. And what I'm going to try to convince you of is that we've uh, basically that what matters is, like we heard in the last talk, is basically the viruses associated with you. And then um, I'm going to talk to you about a new immune system and what we think is going on there. So for everybody, there's viruses and such bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And really, the system has always looks about the same. You've got the infection steps where the, the virus holds on. It ingests its nucleic acids. And then it can go into the lytic phase, which is what we usually think about, or they go into these uh, uh, lysogeny sorts of stages, uh, phases, <laughs> and um, this is where they uh, hang out as cell viruses in the cells. And probably most, if not all, of the cells in your body are infected with at least one virus. All right, so this, uh, this lytic versus lysogenic behavior is really important and will become uh, more so as I talk through this. Remember, the proviruses can actually jump out of uh, cells pretty easily. That's the lamb switch stuff. Herpes viruses have similar things. So they, they're stimuli that let this pop out. UV would be a great example. And then this one is probably uh, less so. Uh, you probably don't know as much of it, about it but it's called superinfection exclusion. And the concept here is that if you've got a virus in the cell, frequently that it, uh, keeps it from being able to be infected by viruses of the same type, okay? So it actually gives you a protection from the virus. Okay. Now, the thing that you guys, I will say, and then you'll all leave the room and forget again, is that basically life is about the viruses, okay? So they're winning, okay? And if you really want to understand biology, you have to think outside the cell. There's more of them. They're more diverse. Okay? They do all these things. They're actually the major predators on the planet. We, of course, think about them killing off uh, bacteria, but if they do the same thing with animals. This is red queen dynamics. We call it kill the winner in the microbial world. They actually control things in a top-down fashion. Um, they move genetic diversity around the planet. So you get virus, you get genes stuck in viruses and they can move us between ecosystems. And uh, unlike the bacteria, they're actually basically still completely unknown out there, right? So almost everything. So we can go into a system and sequence the viruses and 99.9% .9 of the sequences will be completely unknown. All right, this is something just published. This is out of uh, work we did with Alejandro Reyes in uh, the Gordon Lab. And I just want to put this one out. It's been published, but I want to remind everybody that basically the difference between you and the person sitting next to you are the viruses in your gut, okay? So what we've got here is monozygotic twins and their mothers sampled three times in one year. We take fe uh, fecal samples, isolate the viruses. And just remember that basically there's going to be fairly large overlaps between the, uh, 
the twins, because they're monozygotic, so they have exactly the same human DNA, they're going to have very similar uh, uh, bacterial DNA, and then um, they're going to share that with their mothers. First thing, whenever you go into a system, what you'll find here is uh, just a way of looking at this. This is just the percent of assignable reads. In this case, we're going to compare it against the COG database. So we've done all these metagenomes. And here's the viriomes. The percent known by this analysis is under 10%, and it's going to be about 30% for the microbes. That's what we always find. And actually, this is this take-home message, which is that bacteria are boring. And you guys all kind of know this in your hearts of hearts, right? So there's not much going on with the bacteria because they keep doing the same thing, right? They set up a, all your gut is is a big fermenter. It's not that different than if I took a sediment sample or I did, or any number of other things. You can, the species do change, but what's, the biology, what's exciting about biology is actually all these things that are changing between things, right? And they're changing over time. All right. So if we take these people and we look, what you're going to find is that the relationship between your viruses that you have now and your viruses a year later, so far they look like they're very similar. Okay? So it looks like you'll maintain them over time. However, if you look between people, there's almost no overlap, even if you're a monozygotic twin growing up in the same household. So there's something that's very stochastic about how you grab that relationship. And if you just add this up, it kind of depends on how you want to do the numbers, but I'll do the numbers to make the viruses sound cooler. And what I would say is that about 90% of the genes that are different between people are virally encoded. All right, so that's the viruses. Now I'm going to switch, and I'm going to try to teach or try to argue what we think is going on, um, why all this variation might be uh, really cool. And this goes back to mucosal surfaces. So mucos uh, mucosal uh, surfaces are how we interact with the environment. And if you, a lot of life actually is only mucosal surfaces. Okay? So, and these are things like the corals that live up to 5,000 years. We know this from different uh, uh, proxies. So these things have figured out how to live for long periods of time. And they've done it without a classical uh, specific immune system. Right? So this is actually much of life. It's not all of life because uh, insects and, and bats, like, of course, have, don't have mucosal surfaces. But almost everything else has a mucosal surface. All right, so what is mucus? Well, it's actually, for all intents and purposes, it's like this big mish of stuff. So it really is kind of just not. Um, it's got salt, sugar, lipids, proteins, and all these different macromolecules that kind of depends on how old the mucus is and so forth. Um, but the one that we're going to care about right here are the mucins, which are these glycoproteins, okay, which are really cool because glycoproteins are almost combinatorial chemistry systems where you, you make these uh, really cool these uh, proteins and then you start adding different glycosylation patterns to them. And those can, be very, those can vary, like they vary in your lungs. As you go up and down through your lung, they vary as you go through your gut. You have different uh, glycosylation patterns across them. And, of course, they are colonized by phage and microbes. Okay. So here's the beginning of the story that I'm going to argue with you, is that uh, we have this one observation. So one of the main things that we do is we'll go out of the environment, and we're going to count bacteria to virus ratios out there. Okay. So we'll grab a sample, water, a sample of water, grab it. And a lot of our research for a long time was always trying to figure out how you always have this 10 to 1 ratio of virus to bacterial cells in the environment. The only place that that broke down is on mucosal surfaces. So if we look at a mucosal surface, we always have about 40 viruses to every one microbial. And it doesn't matter if it's on invertebrates like something as old as corals or vertebrates like us, right? So this can be off your teeth, it can be in your gut, wherever we go looking. Why this matters is that when you're talking about how viruses hunt, okay, they, they move passively as far as we know. So their interactions are usually modeled as mass action. So now what we've done is we've increased the mass action in these areas by four times. But we've done more than that because normally when we're thinking about mass action, we're actually we're thinking about it occurring in a volume, right? Okay. This isn't occurring in a volume. 
this is compressed on a two-dimensional surface. So your ability to hunt actually is, goes up a lot, and I'll, I'll show you some of the best or worst-case scenarios of that. All right, so initially we thought maybe this is just something non-specific processing, and I'll take you through this. What we found is that um, the, the viruses, in particular with the phage, are not non-specifically interacting with the mucus. mucus. They're actually specifically at, at interacting with the mucus. Here's some different examples. So if we take T3 cells with and without mucus, we're going to add T4 cells, uh, phage to them. Then um, after a while, we'll take off this and we'll add some E. coli and then we're just going to count the number of plaques, so the number of uh, active viruses there. So here are different TC lines and um, what you can see that without surface mucus, we get many fewer phage sticking to it than with mucus. Okay? And if we strip off the mucus layer um, with a, just a, a detergent sort of attack, you get the same sort of thing. And actually, if you just knock down the muck, one of the muck genes, or two of the muck genes, actually, what you end up with is the, uh, the same sort of phenomenon where the phage won't stick. So this tells you that there's something about the muck that are really important to making this happen. Okay? The other thing that we know is that just on a plate, so this is just basically a, a top of our sort of plate, what we'll do is we'll add mucin, DNA, or protein to the surface of this, and then we're going to add the phage again and do this top of our assay. And we end up with the same thing, that really the only thing that's holding, uh, keeping the stage to stick in place is the mucins. All right, now, when this happens, you could ask, well, do these stage become more inactivated or something uh, when they're associated with the mucus? So this is the same sort of experiment, okay? But here we're going to ask, um, basically, how well do the bacteria do when you have the stage? So here is uh, a non-mucus producing one. And you can see there is a difference. So this would be uh, without phage and this is with phage. Of course, the phage kills some of the stuff that's there. That's not really a big deal. However, if we have this uh, plus the mucus okay, here, and what you can see is that you knock down the bacteria by about an order of magnitude. Okay? And that's true whether you do it with just things that produce mucus versus the, those that do not or if you just knock it down with a muck, a muck knocker. Okay, good. All right. Now, the other thing that they do, of course, is they actually protect. So this is the same idea. We're going to use the muck to knock down cells in this case, and we're just going to look at cell death. So we add E. coli. The E. coli eats the cells. This gives everybody that has tissue culture a heart attack. We're adding bacteria to the cell line. So here you've got the... Uh, there's no significant protection. Um, uh, sorry, it doesn't matter. Of course, these guys are happy. There's no real significant protection of uh, having the mucus there or not with E. coli. Okay? However, if we add um, the phage and we have uh, the knockdown versus the, um, uh, the regular, the wild type cell, we see this uh, significant um, difference between having mucus versus not having mucus. And there's a massive difference between having the phage and not. All right. So here's the first part of it. Okay. So this is a, uh, you've got your mucosal surfaces. They're producing all of these different types of uh, uh, mucin uh, glycoproteins. And the phage are sticking to this. Okay. And then by being concentrated here, when a microbe runs into it, okay, you'll get a uh, you'll get a phage lysis event and you'll lose microbes. And that's why we see this shift in this ratio. Okay. All right, so this is actually acquired immunity at that point. Because any system coming in is going to bring its phage with it. Right? All right, what about, is it specific or not? And this is where it gets really cool. So here's T4. And T4 is kind of famous for having this uh, IG-like domain on it called Hox. And about a quarter of all of the phage out there have these Ig domains living on their capsids. And we call those decoration proteins for the most part. Um, they're known because they're actually highly immunogenic. So if you inju uh, inject them into a mouse, you'll get antibodies to them. Okay? There's a lot of them. And these are actually the domains that you use in uh, uh, phage display systems. Okay? So this is when you're building a phage display. It'll be something like this. Okay? 
And so our hypothesis was that Sage did hear mucins through these Ig-like domains. So remember, these are Ig domains like immunoglobulin sort of thing. Okay? And they have massive variation. Okay? They do it differently than ours do, okay? but it's something like 10 to the 13 potential uh, alternatives, okay? which is like T cells and B cells. Okay. It's conferred by a targeted reverse transcription mechanism. So this is actually a, a way of uh, doing adoption. Okay. There's also hypervariable C-type leptin domain. So anybody that is an immunologist should be going, uh, now we're talking IG and we're talking about uh, leptin. Okay. We know that these decoration proteins, for the most part, don't matter in the lab. So we can take them off and the phage do just fine. Okay. So there's something else doing the selection. And then there's this really nice paper uh, by Bushman's lab um, where they did really deep sequencing of uh, some human gut stuff. And what they found is that the, the, they found the same thing, that there was all this diversity between individuals. But then within the same individual, you have all this diversity that's all around these hypervariable regions, right? So this is extremely variable. All right, and this is just showing uh, some from our data. So wherever we go in the world where we have mucus, basically what we find is a whole bunch of these HOC-like or IG-like domains out there, as well as the C-type lesson domain. All right, so is this IG-like looking thing necessary uh, for the stage to bind mucins? And it's the same assay that I showed you before. So we've got the stage plus or minus the HOC. We're going to add it. We're going to put it on the plate with purified mucin DNA or protein. And what we find is that only the Hawk Plus stage actually hold on to the plate. Okay. This is another way of looking at it. So now what we've got here is we've got uh, T4 plus or minus the Hawk. We're going to put it in mucin, uh, in different concentrations of mucin, and then do this multiple uh, particle tracking. And um, what I want you to notice here is just that uh, in Hawk minus, the stage just bounces around by diffusion, just as if they're, if they're not sticking at all. If you uh, have the Hawk domain, though, they slow down significantly, and they're holding on to mucin. This tells you that they're binding in some way. And from this, we can actually get uh, some numbers about how good they're uh, holding on to the, uh, the thing. All right, so what we've got now is we've got an acquired, adaptive, and specific immune system. Okay. All right, so again, we secrete all this stuff. The phage aren't actually just accidentally sticking to this. They're actually holding on through these IgG-like domains. These IgG-like domains are not maturing, just like you would expect if you were running uh, an antibody or something of that nature. And then, of course, they form an antimicrobial layer. And then, if we take the numbers that came out of uh, the multiple particle tracking, and what we've got here is just a very simple uh, uh, diffusion uh, kind of lock and Volterra model. And if you go through all this, what you find out is that the phage are, the mucus is good for the phage because they are going to be about 15 times more likely to find a host in that system. This is just assuming that it's one phage, one host at this point. And the bacteria, it sucks because you're 14 times more likely to die. So let's go one more step with the human microbiome okay, and how this probably works. So we notice all this diversity between people, okay, and this is between corals, and it's the same story everywhere that we've looked. So what we think is going on is that you've actually got what we, it's called the suicide bomber model um, in the phage literature. And the idea is, is what you have is you have a uh, uh, you have a phage population, and some of the lysogens are blowing up uh, uh, at some proportion over time. Okay? And when they do that, they release the uh, they release phage. Those phage then are going to stick to this mucosal surface, okay? and the bacteria that population of bacteria that have the phage is going to be protected from those phage. But any invader that belongs to the same species of bacteria is going to be killed off. Right? Make sense? Okay. So this would give you, so then if you actually think of the mucosal surface, sorry, if you think of the human as one germ layer 
and the sage as, or the bacteria as another germ layer. What you're going to have is this germ layer is now giving you an adaptive acquired immune system okay, that is working just fine, whether you're a coral or whether you're a uh, uh, bacteria, I mean, a, a coral or a human. And as usual, there's tons of people. Um, the people that uh, have worked mostly on this part of it are Jeremy Barr and Lance Bowling. And um, the, uh, the human uh, gut stuff was done with um, the Gordon Lab, and then the math group did all of the modeling for me as useful as usual. And thank you to actually the three doctors that I work with at various times, Doug Conrad, David Roman, and Jeff Gordon. The doctors are actually fun to work with. You guys are more, you'll believe stuff that nobody else will. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, these are, of course, the people that paid for it. And I'll stop there. And we won't get into why that is. <laughs> Um, or might be. Any quick questions? I mean, again, we're going to have a big discussion afterwards. Uh, quick and specific? Very specific. Uh, Michael, do you mind just, again, come to a microphone just so we can... Is there, this is Michael Zasloff. Is there any data that would suggest that phage resistance, any form of phage resistance is a virulence factor in any human infection? Right, so the question is, oh, do we know of where phage resistance would cause, would allow a bacteria to invade? Would make it more... Yeah. Yeah, so, no, not that I know of. That's a good prediction, though. No, I know of no example of that. I do know of examples where the phage go in and cause the disease, but not the other way around. Yeah, that's a good question. I'll have to think about that. Okay. Thanks, Forrest. We will, we will return to this.